Well, good morning. Brother Malin was supposed to do this announcement, so I'll take care of that at workout sometime this week. I'll get back at him. Hey, listen up. I want to mention a couple of things here. The main thing I want to mention is next week is our marriage conference. Hopefully those who have already signed up, I think that, that is already filled up. We're looking forward to an impactful, impactful weekend for those marriage couples that are signed up. If you are not signed up, would you please be praying for those who are in attendance? You may know a personal couple that is. It's okay. I got it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> just get here when you can. It's fine. It's fine. I know you're not preaching this morning, so you just feel like you could just be whatever. It's fine. But no, seriously, be praying for those who are attending the marriage conference It'll be an impactful time. We also have the Good Iron Men's Conference coming up in June, but there is a March 1st deadline to put in a deposit for that, guys, if you're interested. There's some impactful names on this list who are going to be speaking, including David Jeremiah and uh, Vice, former, former Vice President Mike Pence. So it would be an excellent opportunity. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to do our Save a Life offering collection. It's going to be next Sunday, so be prepared, come prepared to give to that. Uh, we did something last year. We voted that we would be giving up to $10,000, but we also want to encourage you to give as a portion of that. So if you would, uh, come prepared to give next week. Also, VBS is coming up. Uh, I know it seems like it's only February, but if you talk to Miss Shannon uh, or, or, or Brandy, they're going to tell you that it's really around the corner. So we are still in need of VBS volunteers. You can go on the church website. And go ahead and jump in and see what needs are there for you to, to serve at. Uh, men's softball team, enough said. Uh, that's a lot of fun. You guys need to, I, I know I need to probably sign up for that. Yeah. I, I feel the pressure. I feel the pressure. Uh, so those sign-ups begin today. Uh, if you have any questions, see Brother Rand Hutchinson. And also our servant of the month is Miss Leanne McDaniel. We wanted to recognize her uh, this morning. She serves on our bereavement committee. She also serves with the ladies sewing ministry and Wednesday night dinners along with volunteering at the thrift store. So she does a lot, a woman of many hats. So we're thankful for her service. With all that said, let's go to the Lord in prayer and turn our attention towards a time of worship this morning. Lord, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for the beautiful weather. You've blessed us. Lord, a new month. Lord, as we gear our hearts and our minds, Lord, to your cross today. Lord, pray that the truth would be reminded that your grace is enough. Lord, your love is enough. Lord, I pray for the unbeliever who has wandered in this morning, Lord, that they have not wandered in by accident. God, you have brought them here with a purpose. And Lord, I pray that the words that are sung, the words that are preached, Lord, the elements of our service are impactful to their soul this morning, that they might see you in a new light they've never fully understood before. But Lord, today, the scales would come off their eyes and their hearts. Lord, that they would see you for the first time. I pray all this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together, church, and let's sing. It's this old familiar chorus. I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee. Just a closer. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking. Daily walking close to Thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. When my feeble, when my feeble life is old. Time for me will be no more. Guide me gently, safely, oh, to thy kingdom shore. 
to thy soul together now just a closer walk with thee granted jesus is my plea daily walking close to thee let it be dear lord let it be daily walking daily walking close to thee let it be dear lord let it be heard an old, old story, kind of take a step back in time with these old familiar hymns. It goes like this. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see and then i cried dear jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow jesus came and brought to me the victory turn it over oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him and all my love is to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood i heard about a mansion he has built for me and glory and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood, beneath the cleansing blood, beneath the cleansing blood. Are you glad you came to church this morning? Have a seat, church. Mm. I don't want our worship time to just be something we kind of glide through or slide through. Something to be sat in, enjoyed with purpose, with mindfulness. Listen to these words of Jesus. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, 
also in me. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If there were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one wanders into salvation on accident. It is through the the Lord's drawing. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, also we know that not only are we, we don't wander into salvation, Lord, we don't wander into heaven. Lord God, you call us. You draw us in. So, Lord, I pray that we put on our, 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 our mind, our minds this, this moment, Lord. Think about eternity for a moment. It's a mind-boggling thing. But, Lord, as we think about the purpose of salvation, Lord, is to draw us closer to you, Lord, that you are our God, that you are our Lord, Lord, that your truth guides us, and Lord, that our minds and our hearts and our bodies, Lord, would fulfill that action of obedience, Lord. Lord, teach us this day, today, Lord. Still our minds, still our hearts still our bodies, Lord. We might sit at your feet this morning and contemplate and ponder of the things of God. Lord, that we might be renewed by those things and those thoughts, by those truths. God, that we might be helped, that we might be guided, Lord, into a stronger faith than we were before we came in. Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a new song. I'm going to invite you just to remain seated. You're welcome to sing along as you learn as we go through it. The verses will sound the same. The chorus will sound the same. But take a listen to these words. It goes like this. Mine are days that God has numbered. I was made to walk with Him, yet I look for worldly treasures and forsake the King of kings. But mine is hope in my Redeemer, though I fall, His love is sure. For Christ has paid for every failing, I am His forevermore. Mine are tears in times of sorrow, darkness not yet understood. Through the valley I must travel Where I see no earthly good But mine is peace that flows from heaven And the strength in times of need I know my pain will not be wasted Christ completes His work in me Let's stand together, church. And mine are keys to 
Zion City, where beside the King I walk, for there my heart has found its treasure, Christ is mine forevermore. We're going to sing this bridge three times. It goes like this. It invites your heart to rejoice. Come rejoice now, O oh my soul, for his love is my reward. Fear is gone and hope is sure. Christ is mine forevermore. Come rejoice now, O oh my soul, for his love is my reward fear is gone and hope is sure Christ is mine forevermore try that come rejoice now oh my soul for his love is my reward fear is gone and hope is sure Christ is mine forevermore and mine are keys to Zion City, where beside the King I walk. For there my heart has found its treasure, Christ is mine forevermore. Christ is mine forevermore. Christ is mine forevermore. Hallelujah, holy, holy, God Almighty, the great I am, big breath, who is worthy, none beside thee, God Almighty, the great I am, hallelujah, holy, holy. Holy, holy, God Almighty, the great I am, who is worthy, none beside thee, God Almighty, the great I am, the great I am. Try this. Close to your side, so heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one. The great I am, 
the great I am. Check this out. The mountains shake before you, the demons run in fear. At the mention of your name, King of Majesty, there is no power in hell, nor any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am, the great I am, the great I am, the great I am. Pray for us, Brother Ben, for the opportunity. Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for this opportunity, Lord, where we have the ability, Lord, the opportunity, Lord, to come lift praises to your name, Lord. We're thankful for that. Thank you for that opportunity. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that you also allow us, Lord, to be able to give back to you, Lord, as we return our offerings and our tithes to you, Lord, that uh, those monies will impact our community, Lord, here locally, in the county, Lord, in the state, in the nation, and worldwide, Lord, as we reach out uh, to all your people, Lord, and just thank you for that opportunity, Lord. I just pray that you would just uh, be with the message that's presented today, Lord. If there be anyone here that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, Lord, that the message will speak to their hearts, Lord, allowing them to know that they do need a personal Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Join the rest. 
resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith. And with one voice, a thousand generations sing worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And on that day, we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith. And with one voice, a thousand generations sing worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Test, test, one, two. Well, I can see that we have lowered our standards this morning. <laughs> As we leave the, leave the book of Acts and go somewhere else. I'm not starting a series, by the way. I'm just, I'm just here for one day. Uh, we're going to start a new series in a couple of weeks. We're looking forward to it. Just be praying for Brother Malin as he continues to allow the Lord to lead him in the direction where we are to go as a church and what book we are to study next. But for today, we are going to be in the book of Matthew. So I invite you, if you have your Bibles, to turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to be in verses 21 through 28. And you can see in the bulletin this morning, if you're taking notes, that I've titled this message, authenticated in Christ, authenticated in Christ, Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 28. So as we prepare here in just a moment to read our text this morning, I want to remind us that Jesus is wrapping up one of the best sermons ever preached. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. And he started this back in Matthew chapter 5, and it takes place in chapter 5, chapter 6, and it ends here in chapter 7. And during this entire message, Jesus has preached on several things, okay? Uh, Jesus has preached on the law. He's preached on murder, adultery, divorce, love, doing good deeds. He's taught us how to pray. He's taught on money, fasting, and so much more. But I think it's necessary, as we see here at the tail end of the sermon, I think it's necessary to see how he ends it. He ends it with a sobering warning for all of the people that were listening to it then, and he ends it with a sobering warning for those, for those of us who read it even today. After everything that he's talked about, he ends it with this warning that we're going to read about this morning. So if you have your Bible with you, I invite you to stand out of reverence of God's Word 
And we're going to read verses 21 through 28 as Jesus prepares to end the Sermon on the Mount. We'll read it together, beginning in verse 21. And Jesus says, not, all, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will uh, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Verse 28, when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. We thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for this moment that we've set aside this morning, Father, to sing praises to your name, to proclaim that you are the great I am, to proclaim the victory that's found only in you, Father. Lord, as I pray, I pray that as we look at your scripture this morning, we will learn through the scripture how to walk closer to you. I pray, Father, that these words will be heard in my heart, that they will be heard in the hearts of all those that are in this room. Most importantly, I pray for your Holy Spirit to meet with us, to speak to all of us, to convict us, to challenge us, to teach us, Help us, Father, to leave this place different than we came, as we've already prayed for this morning. Move me out of the way. Use your words and use your scripture to teach all of us, including myself, this morning, Lord, your message. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. So Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 28, titled Authenticated in Christ. Three points I want to look at. Real quick this morning as we pack, uh, unpack this, uh, these verses of Scripture here as Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount. If you've uh, taken notes, you'll see it in your bulletin. We start off with point number one, and this is the first point. We have the danger of profession without faith. The danger of profession without faith. We see that again in verses 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, talking about the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus had just discussed in verses uh, 15 through 20, what it means to bear fruit, either good or bad fruit. And as he transitions here from that teaching to this teaching, he begins to make a sobering warning in our passage of Scripture. And as he's doing that, he is still speaking to a large crowd. It's, uh, and we, no one really knows the amount of people that are there, but it's a large crowd, and it's a crowd made up of various types of people, good people, bad people, religious people, non-religious people, but they're all zeroed in as he closes the Sermon on the Mount. And one thing I want us to take from these verses of Scripture right off the bat as we, get, as we begin point number one is this, is that it is dangerous to profess to be a Christian while the heart is without salvation. It is dangerous to profess to be a Christian, to be a Christ follower, to be a disciple, while the heart is without saving grace, it's without salvation, it's without faith. When Jesus says that no, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, that is to say that not all who proclaim are announced to be followers of Christ. 
and see the percentage is actually very, very small for those who know Christ on the intimate level, those that know Christ as Lord and Savior. We know that because if you go back to verses 13 and 14, he teaches us this. He says, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. There are few who find it. John MacArthur says that Christ continually emphasized the difficulty of following him. Salvation is by grace alone, but is not easy. And it calls for knowledge of the truth, repentance, submission to Christ as Lord, and a willingness to obey his will and his word. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, a follower of the Lord. Pastor Dean and Sarah says this. He says, Jesus wasn't speaking, and I, and I think it's critical that we understand this because we, we want to we th sometimes throw non-believers and atheists and agnostics and other types of people into this group that Jesus was speaking to, but this was everyday people Jesus was teaching and preaching this sermon to, okay? But listen to what Pastor Dean and Sarah says. He says, Jesus wasn't speaking about atheists, agnostics, pluralists, or secular humanists. He was di directly describing moral and religious people doing good religious acts in the name of God. Religion was deeply embedded into their routine of lives, which gave them confidence, full confidence, that their acts of righteousness, righteousness built an impressive resume, setting them up for a big payoff in heaven. We all know the situation back here in the ministry of Jesus. There were Sadducees and Pharisees. There were those who practiced religious things. There were good people who thought they were doing good things, and Jesus was speaking to those people, those that thought that they had a relationship with the Lord. And this is what he shares with those people. And unfortunately, those same people that Jesus was teaching to, those people that he was speaking to in this passage of Scripture while he was preaching that Sermon on the Mount, that their good works were not going to get them anywhere. And, and sadly, many, many professing Christians today fit that same bill. There are many in this room today who say they do good things, who say that we've done things, that we've said prayers, that we have been baptized in Jesus, but it's all empty. The foundation is empty. The profession to know Christ is empty because it's without true faith and true salvation. Now listen to this. It is assuring and comforting to think that because that we've prayed a prayer, and they're bad to watch preachers on TV. They're bad to come to a, a Christmas service and an Easter service and have an evangelistic service and make that profession to know Christ and get that one-way ticket to heaven and you never see the people ever again. But there's people that's in our churches today that come to church for that assurance of that one-way ticket to heaven. But it's not, a, it's not just about having that assurance that we will one day be in heaven. It's, a, it's another thing to have assurance of Savior and Lord in our life. You see, Jesus is not only Savior, but he is Savior and Lord. We can't just have him as a Savior and leave him at that. We have to have Savior and Lord. They're both together. And that's what he's talking about this morning. Look again at verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? What in the world does that mean? How can we apply that to our life today? Well, this is some modern context here. We could have these excuses. Didn't we say grace before we ate dinner? Didn't we say a prayer before a ball game? Didn't we go to the polls and vote our values? Didn't we believe prayer should be allowed in school? Didn't we go to church? Didn't we believe in God? Didn't we give money to church? Didn't we own and maybe, maybe even read our Bible at home? Didn't we dedicate our child, our baby at baby dedication? Didn't we stay married and faithful and have a good life, a good family, a good marriage? Didn't I say a prayer as a kid and was baptized? Didn't I walk the aisle? These are all excuses that Jesus will hear one day. And he's going to tell those people, 
Depart from me, I never knew you. Your heart was never truly changed. You never truly gave your heart to me to be your Savior and Lord. James chapter 1, 19 through 25. This you know, my beloved brethren. This you know, my beloved brethren. But everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who lips, looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. James is telling us here in this passage of Scripture to let go of all of our filthiness and wickedness to humbly allow God's Word to sink into us and through that allow Jesus to be our Lord and Savior. But it doesn't stop there. James says we are to be doers of the Word and not just those who hear and go about our lives as nothing has changed. We make a profession of Jesus Christ, but nothing has changed in our life. We have deceived ourselves just as these people in our passage of Scripture had deceived themselves for so long. Here's another fun fact, James chapter 2, verse 19. You believe in God, is one, that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe, and you know what? They shudder. We can believe in God just as the demons do, but not be transformed by the gospel. Our lives have to be transformed by understanding the gospel message and in return will result, result in a heart of worship and a desire to follow God. As his true disciple and not as a cultural Christian. It's all about transformation, being transformed by the gospel. It's not about doing these things and, and, and following this list of things to do and checking off the boxes. It's about truly being transformed by Jesus so that we can go and do those things as we have been transformed by the gospel. Dean and Sarah says that, and this is, I'm going to read this twice because this fits the bill for so many of us in this room. Self-proclaimed Christians who worship a God that requires no self-sacrifice, no obedience, no submission, and no surrender are not worshiping the God of the Bible, no matter how much they claim to love Jesus. I'll say it again. Self-proclaimed Christians who worship a God that requires no self-sacrifice, no obedience, no submission, and no surrender are not worshiping the God of the Bible no matter how much they claim to love Jesus. The issue here in this passage of Scripture and the issue that we're talking about is obedience to the Word of God. Salvation and obedience to the will of God go hand in hand. They're not separated. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9 says this, And having been perfected, he became, Jesus became the source of eternal salvation for what? All those who obey him. Eternal salvation for those who obey him. Jesus knows his followers intimately. Think about the parable of the good shepherd. John chapter 10, verse 14. Jesus says that I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. MacArthur paraphrases the words in Jesus that we read a while, that we read a while ago in verse 22 by saying this. I have never known you as my disciples, and you have never known me as your Lord and Savior. We have no intimate part of each other. You chose your kingdom, and it was not my kingdom. That's how you can paraphrase it into our world today. And let me be clear this morning. The Christian life is not going to be perfect. And the Christian is not going to be perfect. I'm not up here saying that we have to live a perfect life. I'm up here saying that if you profess to be a Christian this morning, your life should be a light from that. There should be a difference in your life. There should be a difference between you and the rest of the world. 
but there's, your, your life's still not going to be perfect. Listen to what John MacArthur says, and it, this is the best way to describe it. He says, the Lord knows well that even his most faithful disciples will fail. Think about the disciples, the 12 disciples that we read in the gospel accounts. They failed many times. We as disciples today will continue to fail. He goes on to say that the most faithful disciples will fail, stumble, and fall into sin. Otherwise, he would not have told us to pray that he, we would forgive us our debts in the Lord's Prayer. No Christian is sinless, but the fact that we continually confess our sins, seek the Lord's forgiveness, and long for righteousness is evidence that we belong to him. That's the difference. You continually confess your sins, you seek the Lord's forgiveness, and you long for that sanctification and that righteousness and that holiness that he expects from us as his children and as his, uh, as his disciples. Here's the difference. Those who continually practice lawlessness, lawlessness give evidence that they do not belong to Christ, and that's a hard pill to swallow. Those who practice continually to practice sin, and there's no remorse for those sins, but they profess to be a Christian, you have to ask the question, are they truly believers? Have they been transformed by the Lord? MacArthur says that those people do not recognize or confess their sins or hunger for righteousness because they have no part in Christ. That's the difference. Listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, you will what? You will keep my commandments. John 14, verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will follow my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. Here's the thing. The danger of profession to be a Christian without true faith is sobering to think about for all of us in this room this morning. And we need to honestly look at our lives as people, as believers, as even as non-believers. We need to look at our lives and see where we fall in a relationship with Jesus. Do we truly worship Jesus or do we just admire Jesus? Is Jesus our Lord and Savior or is he our safety net to get us to heaven? Do we fall in the category of those who have these many excuses of good things that they have done? And Jesus tells them, depart from me, for I never knew you. That's got to be the saddest phrase that will one day ever be uttered. Depart from me, I never knew you. And at that time, I hate to tell you this, it's going to be too late. There's no, there's no backup plan at that point. Point number two, you got the danger of profession without faith. Number two, the danger of an empty foundation. This takes us to 24 through 27 in Matthew chapter 7 this morning. I'll read it again. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against the house, and yet it did not fall. For it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. So the danger of an empty foundation. In verses 21 through 23 that we just discussed here this morning, we see a contrast between true and false professions of faith and good works. Now, in verses 24 through 27 that we're looking at now with point number two, we see a contrast between obedient and disobedient hearers. But both groups hear God's true word, but some hear and obey, some hear and disobey. And that's the difference. And these verses of scripture, Jesus points back to everything that he has talked about since Matthew chapter five. You think about that. Again, he's, he's, he has preached on uh, He's preached on divorce, murder, adultery, the law. He's preached on money, fasting, and prayer. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, everyone that hears everything that I have preached from the beginning of this message and acts on them and are obedient, they will be compared to those who has a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
Romans 10, verse 17. We hear this verse of Scripture all, all the time from Brother Malan. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the Word of Christ. Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Therefore, the person who hears the Word of God and does the Word of God, tells what, does what the Word of God tells them to do, can be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And here's the thing this morning. Every single one of us in this room are building. We are building on a foundation of one of these two. You're either building on the rock or you're building on the, the sandy wastelands of this sinful world. And the rock is obedience to the Word of God. The sand is, again, the, the things of this world, the things that brings us down, the things that leave us empty-handed. We're all building, and we're all building for eternity, eternal destruction or an eternal reward in heaven. Again, this is not by, done by works. There's nothing you can do to get to this point. There's no money you can put in. There's no amount of work you can do. Go back to Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. I don't care what you do. It's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Therefore, whether we are saved or lost, we are building. And the question is for all of us this morning is, which foundation do you have? Are you building on the solid rock or the sandy wastelands, again, of this sinful world? Because there's two things. You're either building on one of those, and you've got to figure out which one. Matthew chapter 13, verses 19 through 23. In this passage of Scripture, Jesus tells the parables of the good soils. Here, we give, uh, here he gives a great guide to what true conversion looks like. If you look at verse 23 of Matthew 13, and it's going to be on the screen, but the one who, uh, but the one sown with the seed on the good, good soil, this is the one who hears the word, understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some 100, some 60, and some 30 times as much. It's underlined for you. The one who has the good soil, the seed grown into good soil, is the one who hears the word, understands it, bears fruit, and produces. You hear the word, you're saved, you bear good fruit. That's the difference in this world today. That's the difference between true conversion and false conversion. Dean and Sarah says this, he says, cultural Christians are those who generally believe that they are on good terms with God because of church attendance, a generic moral code, code a political affiliation, and a religious family heritage, and so on, whatever excuse you want to put in there. But here's the thing. God's word is clear, and there is no room for compromise. There are two foundations, the world or the rock, which is God's word, obedience to God's word. We have to be careful that we don't put on our, we don't think we're on good terms with God because of all these things that we say that we do. Our parents could bring us to church, that's not going to get us into heaven. Our grandparents could have been some of the charter members of this church, that's not going to get you into heaven. You can give $100,000 to the church, it's not going to get you into heaven. We have to get past that thought process and understand that True salvation is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not in the good works that we have. It's not in a thing that we've been told that we have or whatever the case may be. It is through salvation and faith and that only by itself. Obedience to the word of God. There are hundreds of people who attend church week after week, but their relationship with the Lord is no different than the rest of this world. And believe it or not, in a room of 200 people, there are those of you in this room who are here today who say you are a Christian, but when you go out these doors, you live nothing as Scripture tells you to live. How can you, you say, how can you be so bold to say that? Because Scripture tells us that. Few find the way on the narrow gate. Many find the way to destruction. Those are his words, not my words. We have to understand that as believers and as, as disciples of Jesus Christ, there's a change in our life. And when we go out these doors, we are salt and light to a world that needs us now more than ever. But if, we're, if we live like them and there's no difference in our life and their life, how do they know we're different? 
Social media has destroyed the world today as we know it because it has given us a platform to do things that you can't take back. Things that you say, conversations that you have, it'll completely ruin your testimony if you are, in fact, a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, more than ever, we have to be careful how we live, what we say, and how we act around people. The difference is a true believer in Jesus Christ is one that has been transformed by the gospel and in return is building on that foundation of obedience to the word of God, building it upon that rock compared to the, to the, to the wastelands of this world, the sandy wastelands of this sinful world, and it's all through obedience. When you leave this room, be different. Let people know that you're different and quit deceiving yourself and quit dece deceiving other people. Listen to this, J.D. Greer, wonderful pastor. His book called Stop Asking Jesus Into Your Heart. This is what he says. He says, surveys show that more than 50% of people in the United States have prayed a sinner's prayer and think they are going to heaven because of it even though there is no detectable difference in their lifestyle from those outside the church. Thus, so many people are assured of a salvation they give no evidence of possessing on the basis of a prayer ritual that they didn't understand. So many people, again, I'll read it for you. So many people are assured of a salvation that they give no evidence to of, of, of possessing on the basis of a prayer ritual that they didn't understand. There's no such thing in Scripture as a sinner's prayer. The sinner's prayer comes between you and the Lord and that special prayer between you and him. A prayer similar to the prayer of David in Psalm chapter 51 where he confesses of his sins and it's heartfelt confession and repentance and remorse for the way he acted. And he changed it. That's the difference here. You can repeat a prayer for somebody, but if you're changing your heart, there's no difference. And you wonder why you still struggle the way you struggle. You wonder why you're not different than the rest of this world. There's never been a true heart change there. And one day, there's going to be a lot of people who go to church week after week who will hear those words from Jesus. And again, it'll be too late. And I'm not trying to scare anybody into heaven because our goal here is never to scare people into heaven. But I don't want you to be disappointed because you've been deceived your entire life. And again, we see this in Scripture. It's not about repeating a prayer that someone prays over you or even walking the aisle. It's about life change and surrender. Listen to what Jesus says in Mark chapter 8, verse 34. And he summoned the crowd together with his disciples and said to them, If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That's true discipleship. That's a daily thing that you do. That's a daily thing that I have to do. Deny yourself, take up his cross, and follow him. John MacArthur says, Only the house built on the foundation of obedience to God's word stands, which calls for repentance, rejection of salvation by works, and trust in God's grace to save through merciful provision. So again, the question this morning, which foundation do you have? Is it an empty foundation and filled with the lies of this world, or is it built upon the rock, which is the obedience to God's word? So point number one this morning, the danger of profession without faith. Point number two, the danger of an empty foundation. And number three, the danger of ignoring the one with authority. The danger of ignoring the one with authority. Verse 28. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. So the sermon is over. The Sermon on the Mount has come to a close. Jesus, the prince of all preachers, has concluded the best sermon ever delivered. And those who heard his teaching, those that are in the crowd that day, they had heard divine truth. However, truth, listen to this, 
Truth preached to such perfection must be received in the heart of the listener if it is to bring salvation. You can come to this place every single week, hear the Word of God preached, but if you don't take it and change it and apply it to your life, there's no difference. There's nothing we can do to help you to get there. You have to do it on your own. The same was the truth here today. He tells them, Though, therefore, whoever hears these words that I have taught and acts on them will be like this, compared to those who hear these words of mine and does not act on them. And they were amazed at his teaching. His, he, he was different than the scribes. His, his, his countenance was different than the scribes. His authority was a difference than the scribes. So what's the response of the people? What's the response of the crowd that we see here? Scripture tells us clearly again that they were amazed at his teaching. Why were they amazed? Two possible reasons. Oliver Green gives two reasons. He believes that the crowd was amazed at Jesus' sermon. Number one, the substance of his teaching. The substance of his teaching. They had never heard doctrine such a way proclaimed and such as he had proclaimed the doctrine. Number two, the manner of his teaching. The manner of his teaching. They had never heard any man speak as Jesus spoke in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus spoke with authority. John MacArthur says that the scribes quoted others to lend authority to their teaching, but Jesus quoted only God's word and spoke as the final authority on truth. He spoke eternal truth simply, directly with love and without hesitation or consultation. And that astounded the crowd because they were not used to that. But here's the thing that we can apply to our lives from verse 28. Being amazed and awed by the teaching of Jesus was not enough to get them to salvation. And the same is true for us today. We can come in here, we can watch stuff on TV, we can listen to podcasts and think, man, what a wonderful message. What a wonderful thing I need to do in my life. But if you don't do it, if you don't apply it, there's no change there. Nothing sets in. It's just another thing that we hear in one ear, out the other. MacArthur says, Jesus not, did not tell them uh, those things for their amazement or even simply for their information, but for their salvation. He goes on to say, but most of the people only watched and listened, only heard and considered, but they did not decide. Even by not deciding, though, you have made a decision not to follow Jesus. And the same was true for them in that boat. And I'm afraid most of us, most of our churches are full of people who hear the gospel message week after week, who are amazed and who are astonished by the word of God preached by the men of God, yet they have never truly decided to surrender their life to the Lord and to follow him. I'm also afraid that we have lots of cultural Christians who want church and Jesus as a crutch, as a social media post, as a co-pilot in our life, but doesn't want to truly live a life of obedience that Jesus commands. It's not something we tell you, it's something he tells you in Scripture. I'm also afraid that, not, that lots of professing Christians will hear Jesus say, I never knew you, even though they say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this and didn't we do that? And he'll say, I never knew you. Depart from me, those who practice lawlessness. Understand that God's great desire is that no person should perish, but that every person come to a relationship and come to repentance. We see that in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, that that person might be filled up to the fullness of God. And this is only available through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Without that, this is all in void. This is all no longer needed. But if without the resurrection, salvation is not there. The salvation that he can provide to all those who confess their sins, deny themselves, and follow him. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is what? He is faithful and righteous so that, we will, so that he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Christian life is not about attending church all of your life. It's not about posting a picture of your family at church. It's not about doing good things and living a good moral life. It's not about having good values, 
It's not about sharing Christian posts or scripture on social media. It's not about saying a sinner's prayer. The Christian life is a life that has been transformed inside and out by the power of the gospel message and a life of obedience that our, to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's about denying ourselves, picking up our cross, and following him each and every day. Not just one time, but every day of our lives. And all those things that I talked about, sharing the scripture online, being a good person, those are good things. And hopefully that'll be a good product of your salvation. But those things are not going to get you to where you need to be without salvation. And again, there's a reason why the gate is so small and narrow that leads to life. And that few find it. But the way to destruction is wide and popular and being used every day. So where are you this morning? I don't know where you are. We're not given that ability to be able to tell where you are spiritually. Scripture says that we can tell a person by their, by their fruit. But even at that, there's false proof. I mean, there's false fruit in this world. You're the only one that knows where you are. Which foundation do you have? Have you been authenticated in Christ? Has he changed your life, transformed your life? Are you a new creation? Or are you the same person coming to church week after week? No change. Don't even care about change. We need to seriously examine our hearts this morning, my, my heart as well. Examine your heart, your mind, your motives and desires. And I pray that our church, a show creek, will be a church full of true disciples who have a desire to change the world to make an impact, to be an example of God's grace and love to everyone. And let's not be a church full of cultural Christians, but a church family that dares to be different and live the life that Christ has commanded us to live. Listen to this as we get ready to close. The decept there is deception when it comes to cultural Christianity. It brings about a danger of professing without faith, a danger of an empty foundation, and a danger of ignoring the one with all authority. But there is trustworthiness when it comes to being authenticated in Christ. It brings about a real Savior who gives real change to real people who make up a real church that changes the world. There's deception and there's trustworthiness. Deception in the world, trust, trustworthiness, and being authenticated in Christ Jesus and saved to be used by him. My prayer is that we all examine our lives and our hearts this morning to see where we stand with Jesus. Let's get real. Let's stop playing mind games with ourselves. Let's stop deceiving ourselves and being deceived by the enemy by thinking that we're good people and that we attend church and we live good lives because at the end of the day, none of those things matter. Broad is the way to destruction and narrow is the way to life, but it is so worth it. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. We ask and pray now that you will take your scripture, your words this morning, Father, and that you will speak to all of us, that you will lead us to make a decision for you. May it be a decision that honors you, that brings us into a salvation, an assurance of, of salvation to you, Father. I pray that your Holy Spirit will move in this place. Those that you are speaking to, Father, I pray that you will give confidence to, Father, to be bold enough to stand up and say that I don't know Jesus, to come down front, to speak to one of us as pastors, as ministers. Lord, maybe you can come down front to pray for a loved one that they know of, or that struggles with these things, that, that has not been changed by your word and by your gospel, by your salvation. Lord, I pray that we will be a church that's real, that's authentic, and that we are authenticated in you, Father. Help us to be bold for you, to be real for you. Help us to be holy because you have called us to be holy, to be salt and light. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Now, this is our time of invitation. I invite you to stand. This is going to be a time for you to make a decision for the Lord this morning. We're going to do the Lord's Supper here in just a little bit. You know, it's possible that you've been taking the Lord's Supper all your life and not even be a believer. 
What better way to have the Lord's Supper this morning than to receive it for the first time as his true child? Think about that this morning. We're, we're preparing to ba uh, baptize a family next Sunday morning. We love to baptize other people. Think about where you are this morning, where you are spiritually. Allow the Spirit to speak to you, and you move as he leads you to do it. Let's sing this morning.